While the 1918 armistice marked the end of World War I, the effects of the war endured long after celebrations had ended. Veterans returned home to a hero's welcome, but the reality of post-war life was different. Around 155,000 injured veterans returned to Australia. The Federal Repatriation Department was created to address the extraordinary challenge of assisting veterans to return to civilian life. With no prior model to work from, the department undertook the enormous responsibility of returning veterans to health and employment, providing medical and financial support to those in need on a case-by-case -case basis. The Repatriation Department's intent was for injured veterans to be fully rehabilitated and no longer require assistance. However, many never fully recovered and remained reliant on the department's support. World War I repatriation records held by the National Archives of Australia provide insight into the legacy of war. At 17, Roland Lording, known as Rowley, was injured by a gunshot wound to his right arm, later requiring amputation, and another to his chest, which left a hole so big his heart could be seen beating. Despite 53 surgical procedures, continuous pain, an addiction to morphine and ongoing mental issues, Rowley married and had three children. The Limbless Soldiers Association praised Rowley, writing that, despite his serious handicap, he set out to help himself. However, his injuries prevented him from maintaining a steady job. Rowley was granted a full pension, which was shy of the living wage, and an additional sustenance allowance for a period after informing the department, I cannot manage on my pension alone. Further insight into the pension scheme is provided by examining the records of Hugo Throssell, Victoria Cross recipient. During the war, Hugo contracted malaria and was wounded by gunfire to the neck, thigh and foot. Applicants for a pension required a medical assessment to confirm their disability was due to war service. Veterans needed to be continuously reassessed over time as pensions were adjusted based on current levels of incapacity and earning potential. Even those with obvious injuries like Hugo had to keep presenting for medical examinations and at times provide additional evidence that their war-related medical condition was ongoing. Thomas Noble was able to claim a pension for gunshot wounds, but not for his mental illness. Mental illnesses were less understood and more difficult to attribute to war service. The medical profession did not understand or recognise post-traumatic stress disorder when Thomas presented with symptoms in the early 1930s. This led to a doctor advising the repatriation department that his present delusional insanity is due to post-war economic factors and is independent of war service. However, in 1916, John Linton was immediately diagnosed with shell shock, now known as a mental illness due to the war. An examining doctor stated, after his return from the war, he was a man broken in health mentally and physically. It wasn't just servicemen who suffered. Nurse Rachel Pratt battled ongoing lung troubles from a shrapnel wound. Rachel was diagnosed with neurosis, even going so far as to make plans to end her life. Rachel spent the rest of her life in mental hospitals, undergoing treatments including shock therapy. Rachel received ongoing support from the repatriation department until she died in Heidelberg Repatriation Hospital in 1954. Search the repatriation records to uncover the post-war experience of veterans and to gain insight into the lasting impact of war on Australian society. Share your World War I research on Discovering Anzacs.